Good afternoon. This is Black Women's Health Across the Lifespan, a three-part collaborative learning series. Today we are at session two, Black Women and Sexual and Reproductive Health. This is through the F.P. Berry Training Institute, and we are funded by Department of Health, HIV, AIDS, Hepatitis, and TB Administration, HOSTA. These are our learning objectives. These learning objectives are actually for um, our entire three-part series. So we are going to discuss, we're going to discuss the unique perspective of health inequities on the lives of young, young adult, middle age, and older age black women. Describe the common socioeconomic determinants associated with lack of access to health care and vulnerability to intimate partner violence in black women of reproductive age. We will also list health inequities that drive disparate rates of HIV and SCI among black women across the life course. Describe the comorbidities in older black women who are or have experienced menopause. Detail the healthcare access and provide a bias and stigma. And we will also, excuse me, we will also analyze the factors that foster resilience in black women across their lifespan. So yesterday, for those who attended, it was just a great session, and I know today will be just as great. I feel you guys are in for another treat. My name is Lisa Frederick. I'm Capacity Building Manager at Health HIV, and I have the pleasure of being joined by my good friend and colleague, Hannah Tessima, who's a lecturer at George Washington University Milk Institute School of Public Health HIV. Hannah is a public health practitioner with 14 years of experience in managing national capacity building training and tech assistance program on HIV AIDS, prevention, care and treatment. She has worked with communities at increased risk for HIV throughout the US and globally. She is a doctoral candidate in public health, health behavior at the GW Milken Institute School of Public Health. She holds a global master's in public health and epidemiology from NYU and a master's in social policy and program evaluation from the University of Michigan. Hannah is currently conducting research on PrEP and contraception uptake among Black women here in DC and teaching a social and behavioral health course on designing evidence-based interventions at, to MPH students at GW. Welcome, Hannah. I'm so glad you are back today. Thank you. I'm happy to be back and I'm happy to be joined by many wonderful colleagues and I look forward to another great session today. We're looking at your chat so we see people welcome, coming back from yesterday. <laughs> we're happy that you came back and we're happy to have the new people that came with us uh, today. So uh, let me introduce Lisa. Lisa Frederick works at Health HIV. She's a capacity building manager. She provides capacity building services on organizational sustainability programmatic infrastructure, as well as systems development. She's devoted 20 years of working in this field of HIV and AIDS, viral hepatitis, as well as sexual health. Lisa has experience providing HIV, TA, and capacity building, uh, leading Elton John and Elizabeth Taylor funded national HIV technical assistance and capacity building programs throughout the Southern US, uh, working to improve health outcomes for black and brown communities. Lisa has also led the development and implementation of a New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Health Literacy, HIV, and Older Adult Sexual Health Community Initiative, providing HIV testing and HIV uh, sexual health messaging. Her expertise extends to translational educational research programs, which resulted in the development of an HIV and older women's program, focusing on issues of intimate partner violence, menopause, sexual health, and resilience. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Hannah. So um, just want you guys to know that this course has CME, CE accreditations, provided jointly by Postgraduate Institute for Medicine and Health HIV. There are no disclosures from any of our faculty or moderators. You should have received CME, CE handouts on how to claim your credit. We are encouraging everyone to complete the evaluation that is sent whether you are claiming credits or not. So we would appreciate all your comments in your evaluation. Thank you guys for that. These are the types of credits we will be, pro be providing for this training. And as stated in the slides. And welcome. 
Um, we are, again, super excited that we have had such a great response to um, this roundtable. And I just want to give you guys just a little background on how this was born. And just as the slide says, this was truly born out of reflection of what we're currently experiencing. This is something that I don't think anyone, myself, Hannah, anyone on this uh, round table that has experienced. COVID-19, this racial justice, justice movement, Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we just wanted to do something of substance. We wanted to get some real conversations around Black women. We wanted to create a platform to discuss all the complexities around health and culture, strength, and the vulnerabilities throughout the lifespan. So as we worked with, my, with our health HIV team and pulled Hannah in, and she was delighted, and uh, we just you know, expounded this to something that we think is, is just, a, just a wonderful platform to discuss. We were able to pull in great um, panelists who were experts in this field, and um, we just hope you guys enjoy today. Hannah, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, but you said it perfectly. That's exactly it. It was timely and it was something that we really wanted to create an opportunity to focus on Black women. So we are really happy that there was such a huge response and, and that everyone came, uh, came back and is going to continue to come yes. tomorrow, I hope. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. So thank you. Thanks, okay. guys. All right. So Let's begin. So much like yesterday, we want to start by characterizing the group. Who exactly are we talking about? And so some of the terminology we hear when we talk about this age group are maybe young adults, young women, women of childbearing age, women of reproductive age. Um, and so the age range that we're talking about is 18 to 45. Um, and that could be a little bit younger, a little bit older, but we're right around that range there. Uh, in terms of development, deve developmental considerations, uh, we are really saying that people within this age group are searching for that uh, need to form intimate, loving relationships with other people. Uh, achieving autonomy and independence are really important, as well as developing emotional stability. If you remember yesterday, it was really uh, focused on adolescent health, and we were saying that people are trying to uh, search for a self-identity, self uh, and there's a lot of exploration in that stage. So now we've moved on to the next stage where we are developing relationships, and that's a key part. Yesterday, the key question that people were asking themselves was, who am I and where am I going? Um, and today, it's a little bit different. We're saying, am I loved? and wanted. And that's something that's really key and important within this age group. Um, and then when we talk about human development, I also just want to say that uh, as we get into these next slides here, that we are uh, focusing on adulthood and human development based on what has come from some of the psych scholars preceding us, uh, focused on uh, Havikhurst and Erickson, and, and they kind of defined what these uh, development milestones really look like. And so there may be other things that we could add and maybe it doesn't go in, in perfect linear order in the way that we're describing. So we're, we're aware of those things, but we wanted to just provide some sort of framework for, for you to work from as we begin this. So uh, women within this age group, uh, development is continuous throughout a person's entire lifespan. So beyond 45, we'll go on and discuss that tomorrow. A person moves from one stage to the next by means of successful resolution of developmental tasks from before. So we've now successfully transitioned from adolescence to adulthood, um, and we have presumably developed a strong sense of identity, and we're now ready to share our lives with other people. And so we know that that could have many implications for, for health as we move forward, particularly for Black women. So people with a poor sense of self tend to have less committed relationships, are more likely to suffer from emotional isolation, loneliness, and depression. And as we talk further, we'll see that those are major threats to quality of life, social isolation, loneliness, and depression. So it's really important to go through these uh, developmental milestones successfully. Okay, so adulthood and development, what else are we thinking about? Within this age group, people are thinking about establishing independence, about being more firmly established in your identity. I know what I like, I know what I don't like, what I stand for, what I don't believe in. Um, maturing through emotional stability, and that comes with interacting with other people. Uh, but beyond that, establishing a career is really important, establishing a residence, managing your home, and maintaining your standard of living, budgeting. Um, becoming part of a group or a community is really important within this age group. Sharing ourselves intimately with others, choosing a life partner, 
um, having happy relationships and a sense of commitment, feeling safe and cared for and caring for others, adjusting to physiological changes that happen within this age group, maybe becoming a parent or child rearing is part of it. But something really, really important to consider with Black women who are within this age group is that Black women are developing and growing within all of these areas in a system that is inherently racist, making this thing a lot more challenging. And imagine we yesterday we talked about ACE scores and how those things follow us through adulthood. So Black women within this age group are carrying things a lot of times within the system that is inherently racist. So racism is a public health problem. And maybe that's something we've been hearing a lot about these past few weeks as the climate has been changing. And, and it's a good thing to acknowledge that it is in fact a public health problem. So racism can be intentional. Sometimes it's unintentional. Despite that, the target of racism still feels those, those feelings that came from that racist act or behavior. Uh, racism can operate on multiple levels. It drives the social determinants of health, as we know, the social gradient, for example, or stress is a major one. Social exclusion is another one of those social determinants. Uh, early life, unemployment, transportation, there are several of them that are impacted by race, if not all of them. Uh, racism is a barrier to health equity. And in, when we're defining what health equity is, we have this quote here from CDC, health equity is achieved when everyone has an equal opportunity to reach his or her health potential regardless of social position or other characteristics such as race, ethnicity, gender, religion, sexual identity, or disability. Um, and I did also want to point out that within this, these series, uh, throughout these roundtables, these three sessions, we're focused mostly on cisgender women, as we are well aware that transgender women have their own unique set of experiences, um, and, and it's, uh, it's a little bit different. And so those, th that would require a whole different roundtable. And so I just wanted to really put that out there, that we are focused specifically on cisgender women for the sake of this, these sessions. So now, when we get to health disparities among Black women, there is this term called weathering, which has been very uh, extensively discussed, and that really refers to the toll of repeated stressors that women, that Black women feel over time. Uh, weathering is particularly important to Black women or relevant to Black women, um, and it, it's really uh, an erosion that happens within the body that's due to constantly being stressed, due to a lot of microaggressions maybe that, that we might experience, whether in the workplace or at school or um, in our everyday lives. And these things are, are sort of subtle sometimes. They can be intentional. They can be unintentional. And really, they are interactions that, that, uh, that are biased, biased interactions that are uh, discriminatory toward Black women. So internalizing all of these stressors can cause a sense of erosion. Um, and that erosion is really referred to as an all allostatic load. So that's the long-term effects of chronically activated stress responses and damaging the body and the brain over time. Um, so allostatic load is important because, particularly to Black women, because we see allostatic load being higher among Black women. So studies show a link between chronic stress and high blood pressure, increased maternal mortality rates, diabetes, um, and many other illnesses as well among Black women. Um, so I just mentioned now, in a study comparing allostatic load scores among Black and white women in the U.S., Black women had the highest probability of high allostatic load scores compared to male or white counterparts. And those racial differences were not explained by poverty or socioeconomic status. And that's a really key piece there because those things don't make a difference. It's really because of race. Um, okay, so I'm going to lead you now to our first polling question. So our first polling question is about a study out of University of Virginia. Okay, so a 2016 study at the University of Virginia of over 200 white medical students found that what percentage of the sample believed that black people have thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings than white people? Did 20% of white medical students believe this, 30%, 40%, or 50%. So just click on the bubble there, whichever one you think is correct. I'll give you a few more seconds. 
you haven't yet answered, please go ahead. What percentage of white medical students believe that black people have thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings than white people? We see a few people commenting. Yes. You can also put it in the chat window, that's okay too. But make sure to answer the polling question. All right, so I think that's done now. All right, so most people said 50%. Half of the, just over half people said 50%, and that is correct. 50% of white medical students believe that black people have thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings than white people. And that's really interesting as, as these medical students go into the field and are providing medical services, what are the implications of that? Pretty incredible, Hannah. Uh-huh. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so what are the implications of that? Implicit bias. So implicit bias is a significant factor within our medical system, uh, as we can see from that staggering statistic. So black Americans are systematically undertreated for pain relative to white Americans. Why is that? Maybe because they don't feel pain as much, just like the statistic previously kind of showed us or that belief is out there. Black patients are less likely to be given medication. And if they are prescribed a medication, it's usually in lower quantities when compared to what to their white counterparts. Um, and this could be for multi multiple reasons. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times black patients are seen as either non-compliant or difficult or maybe drug seeking or you know, maybe some other reason, but, uh, but the pain statistic really stands out there as well, and I want you to remember that. So there are implicit beliefs among white medical students that biological differences between blacks and whites exist such that blacks feel less pain. Um, and so here it is, half of, those black, half of those white medical students believed that black people have thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings than white people. So from here, I believe we want to show this quick video about uh, the risk of maternal mar mortality within Black women. So we are going to transition to this right now. And there are many stories like this one, but we just selected this one for today. Judgment for the planet as so ordered. Judge Glenda Hatchett is used to hearing cases on her television show. Now she's involved in her own heartbreaking legal fight over the death of her daughter-in-law. My precious daughter walks into the hospital and she never walks out. Everybody's here to celebrate. Kira Johnson had just given birth to a healthy baby boy. Judge Hatchett's son, Charles, is heard beaming. <laughs> but a few hours later, Kira was dead. I was irate. I was in disbelief. Never, ever, ever did I think that I would not see her again. Charles thought of his 39-year-old wife as a superwoman. She spoke five languages, raced cars, and was an avid skydiver. Honest to goodness, she was the most amazing person I ever met in my life. The two were excited to soon welcome a second son into their family. Kira came here to Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles for what should have been a routine procedure, a C-section. According to this lawsuit, when Kira was recovering in her hospital room, her blood pressure plummeted, her heart began racing, and she complained of pain in her abdomen. Her family says she wasn't taken back into surgery for 10 hours. There were some very, very clear signs very early on that she was hemorrhaging internally. Are you shocked that it took so long yes. to get your wife back into surgery? I was definitely shocked. We definitely pleaded repeatedly for them to take action. His lawsuit claims doctors knew Kira had excessive bleeding and ordered CT scans. <laughs> but records do not reflect these scans were ever performed. Ten hours after her C-section, she was finally taken into surgery. Doctors reportedly found three liters of blood in her abdomen they were not able to save her. The last thing she said to me was that, um, was I'm scared. And um, I held her hand and I, I kissed her and I told her that everything was gonna be okay. His youngest son Langston just celebrated his first birthday without his mother. His other son, now two and a half, still wakes up crying for his mom. And I would respond, I'll say, well, Charles, he's in heaven. And his response to me will be, well, I wanna go too. 
having that conversation with the two-year-old is something that I, I, um, I don't know quite how I'll ever be able to figure out. Judge Hatchett hopes by sharing their personal tragedy, they can prevent this nightmare from happening to anyone else. We are devastated by her death, her senseless, tragic death. Cedar sinai Hospital sent us a statement saying they are saddened by the death and the toll that it's taking on the family, adding they strongly support their goal of determining exactly why this happened. You're on mute, Hannah. Oops, I was mute there, sorry about that. Okay. I was just saying that I'm reading the comments right now and I see that someone is saying that um, from their account that clients stated that providers tend not to listen to black women because they believe they are overreacting. And this is a very, very common issue. Um, and we know that this story is, is not one in isolation. There have been many stories like this about mortality rates. We know about Serena Williams' story. We know about Beyonce, both of them having to have emergency C-sections. Um, I think in Serena Williams' case, it was about a, a blood clot, multiple blood clots, actually, that were blocking her, her lungs. Uh, and she felt the pain and she knew it because she had experienced that before and she was telling the doctor the doctor wasn't listening in fact they told her that you know we think that it's the the pain medication you're taking after having just given birth that's confusing you so it's not really that you're feeling that pain you're just a little bit confused but really she saved her own life by advocating for herself because she knew something was wrong um, and uh, with, with Beyonce, I think it was uh, preeclampsia. And we know preeclampsia is, the prevalence is significantly higher among black women. And that has a lot to do with that allostatic load we were talking about, about stress and what that erosion within the body looks like. And it's not because of socioeconomic status. It's not because of lack of education. It's not due to poverty or any of these other reasons. It's due to race and the impact of racism that black women feel living in this country that is within a system of racism. So that's really important to say, um, okay, absolutely devastating. I agree, and this, is, this should not be the case, and this is the system we're living in. And so as we get to later part of this session, we're gonna try to figure out together with our subject matter experts that are joining us on the panel, how we can uh, move forward and address these issues uh, in a better way to prevent this from happening. So we're gonna go back to our polling question. Okay, so polling question number two. Black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth than white women. Is this true or false? Go ahead and click the bubble. Black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth than white women, true or false? Yep, I see there in the comments, doctors are not considering women's prior health conditions. Absolutely right. A lot of uh, important details are left out of medical histories because they're not taken seriously. That's completely true. Okay, so we have a couple seconds left on the polling question. If you have an answer, please go ahead and do that. Someone says, is this another trick question? It just might be. I don't know. <laughs> we did have a trick question yesterday. Okay. So the answer is true, and that is correct. But I will say on the trick question piece that for those of you that said false, that could also be correct because I'm seeing other statistics coming out now that it's even higher than that, unfortunately. If you look at what CDC is saying, they're saying it's three to four times more likely uh, for Black women to die during childbirth than white women. So that's unfortunate, an unfortunate trick question. But pretty much everyone got that one correct. Yeah. So uh, in terms of infant mortality, this is another piece. We were talking about maternal mortality, but infant mortality rate for black babies is more than twice that for whites. And this part is the, is the real important piece. This gap persists as the mother's education and income rise. So those factors are often considered as, oh, it must be because of those things, but it's not. And so many studies have, have shown that over time. Um, okay. So trying to go to the next, uh, there we go. Okay, so babies born to well-educated middle-class black mothers are more likely to die before their first birthday than babies born to poor white mothers with less than a high school education. Black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth than white women, and that was the polling question. And in some cases, we're seeing statistics that it's actually three to four times more likely. 
So stress is real. <laughs> That's the message there. And it lives within our bodies. So let's talk a little bit about PrEP for a second. So in terms of health disparities, we know that PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. It's something that when taken daily can prevent HIV. And Black women largely have very, very low levels of knowledge about PrEP the availability of PrEP, um, lower levels of knowledge than any other group of women. Uh, black women are less likely to receive a prescription than other women. In 2015 at Croy, there was a, a piece that came out where it said 1.1 um, uh, million Americans who could benefit from PrEP, um, and then half of those, those people were black Americans, yet only 1.4% of PrEP prescriptions were filled by black Americans. And I think when we look at PrEP users, it's something like 94% of PrEP users are men. So if we've only got 6% that are women, look at this next part in bold. Of those 6% that are women, only 25% were Black, despite the fact that Black women have significantly higher incidence of HIV when compared to other, other women. Um, so let's talk a little bit about health promotion, Black women here. So when we look at DC specifically here, where we're based, or Health HIV is, um, and where HOSTA is, Black women represent 90% of women living with HIV in DC. Black women have lower percentages of being linked to care, achieving viral suppression, compared to women of other backgrounds. And for those of us living, uh, or those of us that are working in HIV, we know that in all, all of these plans throughout the country about ending the epidemic, and even here in DC, the goal is to get to viral suppression. We want for everyone to achieve viral suppression. Black women have lower rates of that. Condomless sex can lead to unintended pregnancy, so there's overlap in the risk behaviors there. So since that's the case, contraception should continue to be part of a conversation and a discussion um, when, when people are going to their, uh, to their doctor's appointments. But a lot of times there are missed opportunities for discussion for both. Um, and we know that uh, unintended pregnancy rates are higher for Black women than others as well. Uh, other things to think about, cervical cancer screening, HIV and STI testing, and then IPV screening, intimate partner violence. Uh, Dr. Oni Blackstock, who we'll hear from a little bit later, had alerted us to an intervention called Cues that was uh, being rolled out in New York City and could be potentially uh, used elsewhere, which helps, uh, it's a tool that helps doctors to be able to talk with their patients about IPV and to, to screen for that. Um, so there are tools out there. Now, what I didn't mention in the very beginning is that uh, when we all sat down with our subject matter experts and we tried to say, what are the areas that we should focus on for this round table? Because there's so many directions we can go and so many things that we can talk about. Um, we had a very, 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 very long list. And so they helped us to sort of narrow that down and we identified some priority areas. And so living in the time of COVID right now, one that we did not anticipate, uh, we said that we wanted to talk about the implications of COVID-19. What are those implications for Black women within this age group of reproductive health or 18 to 45? What does it mean for them? How is it impacting them? Health, promotions and disease, uh, health promotion and disease prevention needs for Black women of reproductive age, what are they specifically? What are women that they're working with talking about? And so we wanted to talk a little bit about that. Black women within this age group and conversations around sex and sexuality, uh, are we having these conversations? Are we talking about sexual pleasure? That was something that came up yesterday. Um, and then some of the psychosocial challenges faced within this age group. Remember before we were talking about isolation and loneliness and depression and some of these other factors, but we'll get into a little bit more detail. And then most importantly, out of all of these things, once we've discussed all of this, what do we do moving forward? And that's what we want to figure out. And that's why we've, we've got some experts with us to talk uh, about this in more detail. So we will shortly begin our panel discussion and, and feel free to chat in with us as well so we can hear about your experiences as well because many of you are working with black women and so we want to, we want to know. Um, okay, so who do we have with us today? We have Dr. Oni Blackstock. She is a primary care and HIV doctor and researcher. She currently sees patients at Harlem Hospital's Infectious Disease Clinic. She's a former assistant commissioner for the New York City Health Department's Bureau of HIV, where she led the city's response to ending the HIV epidemic. Dr. Blackstock is a native of Brooklyn, New York, and holds degrees from Harvard College, Harvard Medical School, and Yale School of Medicine. She is passionate about and committed to achieving health equity, particularly for those communities which have been historically marginalized. And then we also have with us Kimberly Kennedy. So Kimberly is a 33-year-old HIV AIDS activist, advocate, mother, 
and wife born with HIV. She has dedicated the past 18 years of her professional life to working in the area of human sexuality with a specific focus on HIV AIDS, STIs, advocacy, and the elimination of other health disparities that impact women and youth. Her motivation for her work stems from the loss of both parents at the age of nine due to complications from AIDS. Kim's journey in health education started at age 15 when she was a peer health educator in the Teens Helping Each Other program located at SUNY Downstate. Uh, Kim has worked across several organizations over the years, not only as a health educator, uh, but with the lived experience of being a youth-led change maker. Kim currently works for Red Hook Initiative, where she is the reproductive health manager. Kim has dedicated the last three years at RHI to growing the reproductive health education program with the launch of the new Peer Health Navigators program. So thank you very much for joining us. We are happy to have some experts in this area that are passionate, that are experienced and very knowledgeable and can share uh, you know, what you've learned over the years and what you're continuing to learn with all of us here. So thank you for joining us, both of you. All right, so we wanted to ask a few questions, then we'll open the floor to everyone else that's here today. Uh, so the first question that we wanted to pose to you is really about characterizing this group. We wanna make sure that we're, we're uh, sort of ident or identifying the key factors that we need to be thinking about in terms of human development. So how do we characterize this group? What are some developmental things we may need to consider maybe to add on to what we've got, we've already said? So I'll, I'll pose that to Oni first and then to Ken. Okay, great, thank you so much. Just wanna first say thank you so much for the invitation um, to be here in this round table. I love anything that focuses on black women, I'm happy to be a part of. Um, and also just say what an honor it is to be on the panel with Kimberly Kennedy. Um, who I'm always like in awe of when I hear her speak. So very excited to be here. Um, yeah, so I think some of what you mentioned, um, Hannah, around um, autonomy and independence, I think really sort of having this evolving identity and sense of, of oneself, I think is really important. I'm just thinking to my, of myself sort of on the tail end of the closer to the 45 now, um, and just so many aspects of my own identity that I've discovered, um, particularly in the last like five, 10 years around, you know, including being a parent um, in particular. Um, and so, you know, with that comes various responsibilities um, that we have. And I think particularly for black women, probably more so than most other groups of women just in terms of, of caregiving and the multiple roles that, social roles that, that we play for, not just our, our nuclear families, but extended families and also um, chosen families. Um, and I think also around, you know, sort of evolving sexual health and reproductive needs as well um, are happening then. So I think it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a span that like, there's a lot, probably a lot happening there. Yeah, it is a big range when you think about it, 18 to 45, a lot happens in that time, mm -hmm. right? Okay, Kim, what do you, what do you think? Um, when I think of 18 to 45, or sometimes they can even switch to, some might think 16. Um, it's like the self-discovery age and trying to come into one's own self when I think of that that age so for me being 33 it it I'm still trying to figure out what I want <laughs> what I need in my life and I have a lot and, I, and I'm I'm successful and I have a family but at the same time it's the you work 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 but now it's the focusing on the mental health and the emotional part that you kind of don't really have training for um, and you're going to figure it out at this age and then even in 45 it's still a new self-discovery so you're self-discovering everything it's like every seven years it's a new kind of fold of what you're trying to figure out with your life so um it's just a self-discovery age and hopefully I, I hope that at 46 47 I kind of get it together we all kind of get it together where it's a it's a new fold that we're trying to figure out um so yeah it's a lot going on trying to figure out the birth control, getting health insurance, getting off your, um, your parents' health insurance, um, trying to figure out what is health insurance? Why do I need it? Why do I need life insurance? Like it's things that we don't talk about in adolescence that you kind of figure out as you're going and as you're moving like a moving car that it's like, oh wait, I might need this. Oh, I might need that. And you don't figure it out until you're rolling with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that. And somebody commented here, Robin Harris says, self-discovery never stops. And that is true. So true. And tomorrow when we talk about older women, I think that that's a topic that's going to come up as well. How self-discovery goes on throughout uh, a woman's lifespan, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's move on. Um, what are some of the key contributing factors 
to the high infant mortality rates around Black women. Um, Dr. Blackshaw, we'd like to pose that to you first. Sure. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's multifactorial, but it's really rooted in um, structural racism and sexism. I was thinking about um, the picture that, um, I'm assuming you're able to, everyone's able to hear me okay? Um, the, one of the graphics that Hannah showed around, you know, the system being inherently racist and having to deal with that as we are like living our lives, but also to recognize the sexism that exists and the, you know, as people say, misogynoir um, that exists, a special flavor of, of misogyny. But just to think about, um, for instance, um, most Black women get their uh, maternal health care in sort of Black serving hospitals, which tend to be under resourced. Uh, when we think of, even about like the COVID-19 pandemic, when we look at the hospitals that got like the most federal funds, these are the really large healthcare systems that don't tend to be in our neighborhoods. And many of the community hospitals were, you know, they were doing GoFundMe's for PPE. So like, it's the same, it's a very similar situation that we're dealing with when, when women are getting their care in these under-resourced and historically under-resourced settings. Um, I think also access to reproductive health care and quality health care is um, also part of that. So we know that there are disparities in access to, contracep to, to contraception and to, to quality counseling. Um, for instance, we also know that Black women are also more likely to be uninsured. And so as a result of that, having less access to you know, being able to talk to a provider about what are their various options when it comes to, to family, um, family planning. So that's like a big part of it. Um, and then women also, when they don't have insurance, they end up foregoing <clears throat> prenatal care. So they're getting into care much later in the course of their pregnancy. Um, you know, and if you are able to, to get like preconception care in particular, so before you even conceive in prenatal care, you can basically address or work with your healthcare provider to address whatever medical issues you have that may, and, and, and also mental health issues that may impact your own health and your pregnancy. Um, too. So those are just some of some of the issues, and I think speaking to the case with Doc, with um, Judge Hatchett's um, daughter-in-law, um, then also the issue around like provider bias. So like once you're actually in the hospital or in the clinic, you know if whether providers are taking seriously the complaints that you're having. I mean, I I am like so traumatized when I think about um, my pregnancy. Uh, and what my delivery, but, like everything that could go wrong went wrong, and I'm a physician. And I thought I could advocate for myself. Um, you know, many, many people probably heard about um, doulas and how there's a lot of, there's increasing data to suggest that doulas um, can really help to address some, of the, address some of these disparities just in terms of being an advocate for the women that they're, they're caring for. And I like wish in retrospect that I, could, I had a doula or just someone else, because you're just, it's such an emotional, you know, an overwhelming experience. You know, someone who could really, you know, has the experience and can speak for you. So. I know I mentioned a lot, but there are a lot of different things, all really rooted in sexual racism that perpetuate these inequities that we see in terms of maternal mortality and infant mortality among Black women and children. Yes, and um, you pointed out so many great things that, you know, and reiterated a lot of the things that Hannah presented in her, in her presentation. Um, thank you for that. Um, Kimberly, through your lens, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Um, and he said a lot, <laughs> one of the things what I think about is, and when Oni said something about thinking of like her own pregnancy, I kind of thought about why well, I really struggled with get, um, having, having my son. And one of the things somebody, one of the things that I wish that I would have done or like would have known was maybe to advocate a lot more because I advocated for myself, but things happen, <laughs> things that you wouldn't even think would happen. And I'm somebody who teaches reproductive health and who's been trained in this. And when you're vulnerable on the table, you kind of forget sometimes that, you know, I'm not just the teacher, but I'm also the advocate for myself. And a lot of the times it's advocating so much that you get tired. So I think if I didn't have the education that I have, or the persistence to say, no, I need you to switch my medication. I know it's the medication because I know my body. I know my body is going through this. It wasn't doing this before. It's, it has to be a different factor going on. So for me, I advocated until it was the point of literally passing out on the table and they had to put me under because I didn't, I didn't, have, it, I didn't have no more energy. 
because I knew something was wrong for me. And there were, there were a lot of complications. So I think it's lack of education in our community because we don't teach this in school. There's no after school, pro a lot of funding has been cut with after school programs. After school programs don't wanna put this in where we're talking about our body. Even just knowing the proper terminology where what our body parts are as young adults changes how we are when we are older adults because identifying this is my vagina this is my cervix knowing where your cervix or your uterus is knowing that you don't have five holes like different things like that helps you actually advocating for who you are in your care so i think that plays a really big part and like actually standing up for yourself um i would say would be one of the things that i can say that needs to be done and that's incredible and you're so right and unfortunately there are so many women that are not in tune with their bodies you know and also having the confidence to advocate for, for yourself like you said hannah serena williams saved her own life by advocating for herself so thank you those were those were wonderful um responses we appreciate that so uh dr blockstock you had mentioned something about gofundmes for ppe that's incredible. I hadn't heard that. And it's very discouraging and disappointing that that even has to happen in, in this country. That, that I really, I personally feel like that should not have to happen. Um, oh, totally. but, but that just leads me to the question around COVID and the implications of COVID. How might they be different within this particular age group among Black women? And what does, what does that look like? Right. I mean, so I think there are lots of things to think about, right? So I think first um, thinking about childbearing preferences. So, you know, if people are dealing with, you know, just this overall global uncertainty of what's happening, you know, many people, particularly Black people, Black, black women in particular, so women, women and women of color and Black women in particular are being really hard hit in terms of losing jobs um, during this pandemic. Um, very different from what was seen during like the 2008 recession, which tend to tend to focus more on jobs that men had. Um, and so when people are losing their jobs, you know, they're losing any employer based health insurance that they had. And so their ability, again, as we were talking about to have access to, you know, gynecologic care, whatever care is needed. Um, and so there's some data suggesting that um, black women are more like most likely than any group of women to say that during the pandemic, um, that they want to have fewer children or, ha or defer having children or so pushing children to later once they have a better sense of what's going on, which of course is really under understandable. Um, you know, there are also challenges getting access to sexual reproductive health services. We know that a lot of clinics you know, had to close down, not close, not close down or have more limited services. So only for, you know, urgent appointments. Um, and so, you know, people are also concerned about going out to clinics, right? Or going on to having to go on public transportation to get to the clinic. So all of these are, are barriers in terms of um, accessing care. Although we do know that telemedicine um, for some people has helped to um, fill some of those gaps, but we know again, there's a digital divide yeah. They're just there, you know, people don't have, um, you know, I was talking to one of my patients recently and she was like, I guess I was taking a while doing a television with her and she's like, I have to go, my minutes are running out. And I was like, okay, don't worry. I just want to check and make sure you're okay. Um, but, you know, these, these are real things that can impact the care that people receive. Um, we're also, there's also some data, this is data out of the Guttmacher Institute, which is focused on sexual reproductive health. Um, that more women are choosing, and black women in particular, long acting contraception. Um, and, that, and that when they are on contraception, even if it's not long acting, if it's like the pill, they're using it more consistently or condoms or whatever. People are not, many people are not trying to get pregnant right now. Um, you know, and then also just to add, um, with, you know, when things were um, under more lockdown than they are now, you know, there was um, you know, really a lot of concern and still is about intimate partner violence. So people in, in very unsafe, women in very unsafe situations. I mean, this, just the stress of the pandemic also adding, adding to that. Um, so those are just some of the, the things that I think um, are impacting women, particularly Black women during this time. Mm, that's really interesting that people are adhering to medications a little bit better during this time. And that's really, that came up yesterday in the adolescent group, now that I'm thinking about it too. Adole uh, you know, you're saying in case of adhering to birth control yesterday, um, Yafet was saying uh, adhering to HIV meds more because of COVID. So that's, that's interesting to hear. Um, Kimberly, was there anything else that you noticed that, that, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, when we talk about telehealth, um, so I work with primarily 15 to, I want to say 30 year olds. And 
me explaining to them what telehealth was was one of the most difficult things ever because they couldn't wrap their head around i'm sitting in front of a doctor and we're going to be talking but they're not checking my vitals they're so i'm supposed what if i don't have or haven't seen my doctor in over a year so now i'm telling my new business to a new doctor so how do i even build up that trust do i even want to do that but i'll wait i'll be itchy for another week i'll be okay i'll, I'll maybe the itch will go away i will google some homemade remedies and <laughs> figure out what this is or trying to navigate one of the things that i was highly stressed about because i live maybe an hour and a half a half hour and a half away from my job but i'm doing remote work at home at this very computer and one of the struggles that i had was being running a program or running two programs while teaching my son doing remote work wow. um trying to figure out what his work is because <laughs> i'm not the primary person who helps him with his homework so now i'm relearning concepts that i got a, a idea of which is causing more stress because now i'm helping him he's coming and sneaking in like mommy would i need help and i'm like give me a minute i'm in a meeting and trying to juggle that and then go back to him and then it's like okay i get to breathe because it's lunchtime, but then i have to make dinner and print that and then come back for a meeting so and then also help somebody else who is trying to figure out how do i get um how do i get prepped or how do i even get plan b when i'm the person that would help that inside of the area of red hook which has no resources and then <laughs> trying to say you know what i'm gonna get money out my pocket give it to cash app it to somebody else, get the reimbursement, get to get the reimbursement, wow. and then have to figure out one of my, my students to then go and transport that to a, to a client. While I'm on the computer at like eight o'clock in the morning on the phone, trying to figure out where's the nearest pharmacy, how much does it cost in that area? How can you leave out the house and feel safe to leave out the house? without your parents asking you questions because the only safe place that you can go would be my actual job. Or because we're in lockdown, nobody's going anywhere. So and a lot of them still live with their parents, even if they're 25 or if they're 30. So it's, or if they're with their partner and they have to tell their partner that they're leaving and it's like, where are you going? So it's like even those conversations and prepping those conversations have been a lot more complicated because it's no face-to-face -face interaction. And it's how do we get these resources to them without putting them in danger in their household with their family or with their partners? Because a lot of them is they're stuck in a space where they can't move, where they don't have resources, they don't have the money because they might have lost their job, they might have been furloughed. Um, it's, it's a lot of factors <laughs> that mm -hmm. happens when it comes to COVID that I, that I've seen. Um, the living conditions sometimes the living conditions play a part. Um, and a lot of it is culture like some of them even with the cultural barrier of having to get resources and it's like i don't want to one that's against my religion or two it's not just culture of like where i come from but culture in my household where i can't say certain stuff and i can't do certain things so i think so for me it, it was drove me crazy causing me more stress <laughs> as somebody who helps with this where right now currently I'm on leave from my job because I couldn't handle everything because I realized that I was getting stressed out to the point of I'm having anxiety attacks, which is another thing when it comes to COVID <laughs> and somebody who falls into that range. So, yeah. Yeah. And just to, I'm sorry, Oni, definitely with a panel full of New Yorkers, we know that New York apartments can be very small. Yeah. No, for sure. And, and, and just to recognize what Kimberly, Kim was saying, you know, I left the health department I, on July 31st because I was literally, and I totally recognize what you're saying because I was doing my job as assistant commissioner. We were also involved in the COVID-19 response. And then I was doing the crisis homeschooling. I was like, mm -hmm. this is not sustainable. And no, yeah. and no one said, you know, stop, you know, maybe do one job, don't do all of this. And I realized I had to look out for myself. Myself. So you looked out for yourself. You said, this is, I need this time for myself to, you know, so to focus on me. And I was doing the same thing. We have yeah. to. Yeah, COVID right. taught me to give permission to myself to say stop, yes. which was something that I struggled with um, the whole uh, the whole time, like me working as a, as a youth and taking care of my grandmother, taking care of family, um, not taking care of myself and recognizing that 
as a black woman, it's, I feel like I have to fight harder because I have to prove something, not just to me being HIV positive and I want to be more than my HIV, but then also as somebody who is successful, somebody who is a leader, somebody who is have little kids looking at me and I want to be more for my son. Mm -hmm. So I have to give permission to myself to say, you've got to stop. You have to chill and it's okay. And something will, won't get done and it'll get done eventually, but it's not all on you and somebody mm -hmm. else will pick it up. So it's honestly, I think the COVID has been a, a light, uh, been a, a bright light <laughs> <laughs> that told me I need to readjust and figure out what I need for myself. But it's also, it's, I see that uh, it's a big pattern for a lot of my coworkers and a lot of my, my friends where we're all trying to figure out what is going to be the new setup and how do we want to live? Because what we were doing before was not working. And you see it when you're in the home and you're like, and everybody else tells you you're stressed out. You're like, I'm good. I'll take a nap. <laughs> Maybe I'll take a day off. You know, I'll go get my nails done. And then you realize, oh no, it's, these are behaviors that I teach and that I tell people to look yeah. out for that I'm exhibiting that I am not taking control of. So I think COVID really shined a light on that. <laughs> That's so ironic. <laughs> so true. Definitely, that was one of the reasons when, when, when this, this whole series, um, just a reflection of, this, of the time that we're in. Yeah. And that's really what created this, this, this learning series. And Hannah and I just talked about reflecting in this time, COVID-19 and what's happening in Black America. This was, that's why this is such a timely conversation because we are experiencing something that we've never experienced before. Um, Lisa, before you jump into your next question, I just wanted to read some of these comments here. People are saying, advocating for yourself is your best tool. Uh, as a woman's healthcare provider, I make sure I give my patients permission to take care of themselves. Self-care is not selfish. Um, there are so many comments here. I can't read them all, but they're just pretty much agreeing with everything that you're saying. Life is already hard enough, now COVID, living within this system. So many women are sharing the same feelings that you're, you're feeling, wearing many hats, being a superwoman, crisis homeschooling. <laughs> so your message is definitely getting through. I can't even imagine that homeschooling with everything else going on. I couldn't even imagine <laughs> that. So Oni and Kimberly, hats off to you. And also, and I think we do know that I think that's kind of who we are as women, especially black women, we take a lot on. We take that on, <laughs> you know, ourselves. And this is a time, like, as we're saying that we need to reflect and, you know, and, and bring some self-love to ourselves and see how we could really handle these situations, um, you know, without putting, our, putting more stress on ourselves. So great conversation. Thank you. Uh, so let's move on to what are some of the specific health promoting and disease prevention needs for Black women in this age group? Uh, let's start with Dr. Blackstock. Yeah, so I think um, a little bit of what we spoke about um, already around, um, you know, contraception and family planning. I think um, I was reading that Black women have the highest rate of unintended pregnancies. Um, and that's because, you know, I mean, for many different reasons that we don't, aren't given, we don't have the space and always the time to sort of think about um, proactively, you know, what our, what our plans are. Um, so, so that is, you know, obviously an area that's particularly important for um, people of reproductive age. Um, cervical cancer screening, um, usually mammograms don't typically start until age 50, 40. We, you, you, we do offer them, and I myself do get them, although the data is um, a little bit not so solid um, in terms of 40 to 50 getting mammograms. But after age 50, we do know from 50 to 80, there is um, a health benefit for mammograms. Again, I was saying cervical cancer screening. Again, you know, HIV testing, we think of as a routine part of, of healthcare. Um, and I always tell my patients, they're like literally only two or three blood tests that are like recommended for everyone. And I think if I say HIV test, um, cholesterol and then plus or minus um, screening for diabetes depending on any other illnesses you have or family history. Um, and then also obviously with HIV testing that can be the gateway to if you test one test negative to the whole prevention toolkit which includes PrEP which Hannah mentioned when folks are positive you know now we do immediate treatment so getting folks immediately on treatment because there's a lot of data to suggest that um, that has positive health outcomes. I saw someone said blood pressure. Yeah, blood pressure. You know, that's you know, it's a that's a really good point. Um, we often like don't pull that out because if it's something that whenever you go to the doctor or 
your healthcare provider that they do immediately, and that's a screening that they're doing, right, um, for your blood pressure. So blood pressure is particularly important for many of us, I think because of the weathering that Hannah talked about, because of the stress of living in this society as, as Black women, um, can often be diagnosed earlier than, than, than is typical um, with high blood pressure. So yes, with high blood pressure screening and then um, screening for other sexually transmitted infections. So just to say a lot of women are, I, I find that there's a lot more stigma actually associated um, with non-HIV STIs, so herpes, um, HPV, people, there's a, there's a great deal of stigma. Um, and so, um, you know, just talking and getting counseling around that and testing when appropriate. Um, and then, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions that the audience might have around those. And then intimate partner violence um, screening. I think someone I saw in the Q&A mentioned the cues, the Futures Without Violence cues intervention. And that's what Hannah had mentioned at the beginning. Um, and that's an intervention that moves away from the screening. So asking people if they have experienced, you know, hitting or various types of trauma, because that can be triggering and people may not want to disclose. Um, to switching it to um, a universal education approach where we really talk with our patients about the importance, how healthy relationships contribute to our health. And when we're mm -hmm. not in healthy relationships, that can harm our health. And really giving people uh, the window um, to share if they want to, but if not, giving them information um, to reach out to a national hotline, to reach back out to the provider if they feel that's appropriate at a later time. So those are some of the, the, the issues I think that are around health promotion and prevention, focus on this age group. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Kimberly, you have something to add that you'd like to add to that? <laughs> I think Oni covered <laughs> <laughs> You need to start with Kimberly next time. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I know, Kimberly, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, oh, that one of great. The, uh, <laughs> you covered, you did the whole list. But you know, um, I think for me, and I, I've said this before, and I think I will continue to say this, is that we need to, I know we're talking about young adults right now, but I really, really, really think that if we target, them, target people younger and keep building up and introducing that into schools and not just with the screenings of HIV, STDs, like everything like that, I really honestly think that there needs to be more mobile units that can be in different neighborhoods, not even just high-risk neighborhoods, but like the connecting neighborhoods to the high-risk neighborhoods. Because some people, and, I, and I'll speak about where I work at. I can even speak about, I live in Canarsie. So it's like, Canarsie is very resourceful, but it's not at the same time. Because it's so, so far away, but it's in Brooklyn. So it's like, yeah, you have Brooklyn Hospital, but Brooklyn Hospital has so much stigma that uh, attached to it that nobody really wants to go there unless you have to go there. Whereas like in Red Hook, it's one clinic. It's only one. And nobody wants to go there because the majority of the people that work there live in Red Hook. So you have that, I don't want to go get screened. Right. I don't want to go get yeah. tested because what if Shirley from the block sees me <laughs> mm -hmm. and she goes and tells my mother. Yeah. So it's, a lot of it is if we teach the people and teach the students at a younger age how important it is. And that's not even just by having classes and speakers coming in, but something as simple as I am a reader. I will be on the bus and I will be on the train and I will see something on a wall and I'll read it and I'll take it in. And then if I could repeatedly see it, if I see it over and over and over, it makes me wanna go get my phone out and see what is the thing that I'm seeing. So having these different types of screenings and important for people that look like me on these posters and when I say look like me like black women on these posters it's like oh, okay that is for me and I think that's a lot of the disconnect when it comes to prep that nobody wants to take it because I don't see anybody who looks like me on these posters so if there's nobody who looks like me I'm not going to think that that's something that I would need or somebody in my community would need and I think that's what we're hitting we're missing right now is that it was so heavily promoted for a different demographic that when it comes to us, it's like, well, why do I need that? Mm -hmm. I got to take another pill. Like, I ain't got high, high blood pressure. So now I'm doing like a high blood pressure. I'm taking this pill. Um, I got bad anxiety, so I'm taking this. And now I got to take another pill every day when I'm not even sure when the next time I'm going to have sex. Like, why would I do that? And it's like, I'm already on some long-term birth control. So I'm going to take the birth control and then I got to think of side effects. And this is just me thinking of side effects. I don't know if everybody else is thinking of like 
what are the side effects with all the medications that I'm on? Because a lot of Black women already have different illnesses and different things that we are already struggling from at such young age. And it's this age right there that we're like, everything is unfolding. Like, I didn't know at 33, my knees could crack. Like, why are my knees cracking? <laughs> <laughs> just, just wait for it, Tim. It's going to be a lot more crack. <laughs> wait for, wait for not, it. <laughs> just wait for that. <laughs> I know it's like a lot more things is going to be happening, but it's just like, you know, for, for us growing up, it, it was no, and I know a lot of it's best at home, but if somebody like me who grew up in a really religious household where sex is not a topic of a conversation and if you I was lucky enough to have people around me to say hey do you I, I was always wanting to get out the house so it's like hey do this or learn about this and that's how, like how I started was not wanting to be home and it's not a lot of those programs that got me out the house to want to learn more to just honestly just to make some money and to not be home praying all day got me to, to do this 18 years later and I, I, we need a lot more programs to educate our youth so that way when they get to this point and they get to this age there's a better understanding of how important it is or even just to see what a speculum looks like and this is something that I have on my desk and I'm like look at this and they're like oh a duck beak and it's, it's like no this is what happens when you go to the gynecologist touch it feel it like you have the right to ask these questions when you go to the GYN. So it's much more than the screening that's actually informing them why, but then in their language of how they can understand that this is important and why they need it. Um, can you just let us directly to the next question? So yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> jump in right there. Can I just want to please remind um, participants to please put your question in the Q&A box. We have a few more questions and we're gonna open it up to our participants um, after one or two more questions. So if you guys can just put yeah. that into the Q&A box, we appreciate it. Can, can I just also, just to, just to add, because I saw a comment come up, um, I think related a little bit to something Kimberly also said, but I didn't mention is mental health um, in terms of like screening and, and, and addressing, addressing mental health. It's incredibly important. I know um, Kimberly had mentioned panic attacks. Panic attacks, I also suffer from panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, have, dealt with depression um, and this is like not uncommon I think for black women just given so much of what we experience I think a lot of it for me also was related to being you know to work and having different demands being in settings in which we're not supported um, and so I think just not enough attention is given towards our like socio-emotional um, health and mental well-being and it's something that's not often screened for or checked for when we go to healthcare providers so Sometimes they'll do like the, it's the PHQ-2 or like they'll do a quick screen for depression, anxiety. Um, but often the follow-up isn't really sufficient and often we don't always have the insurance that will provide us access to, you know, a therapist long-term or a psychiatrist long-term. So these, these continue to be challenges, I think. And I think someone also mentioned there's also stigma with going to go see a therapist. Like there's something mm -hmm. wrong with yeah. that within the black community. And that's yeah. something that's, that should and, be addressed as well. And so I keep on saying, so, so, so PHQ-9, just to say someone just put in, PHQ-9 is the full um, screening for depression, but often they'll do a PHQ-2, which takes two of the questions that are the most like, are the strongest predictors um, when things are, and they often do that for screening. So PHQ-2 that I mentioned is sort of the abbreviated version of the PHQ-9 that's done for, for depression screening. Okay, thank you, Oni. Uh, so people are also, uh, going back to the conversation we were just having about language and about talking about sex and that kind of thing, Kim, what you, you were mentioning, people are saying, I had to learn for myself, you know. Uh, people are saying, we should be talking about this younger. We didn't even discuss sex at all. And people are talking mm -hmm. about religion, you know, sort of being a barrier to having these kind of conversations. Religion is, is, a, is an issue here. Um, and then you also talked about, here's a speculum, this is what it looks like. And earlier on, you said knowing where your cervix is, where your uterus is, this is really important that Black women should know these things, but we really are not educated on these things, especially earlier on. So that kind of leads me to the question that we were going to ask around women within this age group being included or excluded when it comes to conversations around sex and sexuality. Like, are these conversations happening? Are they not happening? If they are, with whom? Where are people 
you know, where are these sort of conversations taking place? Um, and then the significance of language, like how do you approach these kind of conversations? Maybe what would you, what would be your advice to a provider in this situation or anyone else to, to create better health outcomes as a result of having these kind of conversations? I, I'll start with Kim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> for me, I guess for the language is understanding that everybody, and this isn't language of like origin of where you come from, but understanding that I might call a vagina a chocha, I might call it a pocketbook, I might call it a little twinkle twinkle little star, but if I don't understand what you're saying and you don't, and it's good to, so I'll back up. I, I how I have my son is ten years old, and from the very beginning of me him going to daycare, him going anywhere. It's, this is your penis, okay? Do not call it my little stick. Do not call it my little flingy. Don't. <laughs> this is what this is. This is, you know what the function so far is, okay? This is this is what's going on. And as he grew up, it I explained more. Now that's just me working somebody who works in the field and who's comfortable to say it, but also knowing that growing up, I wasn't able to say that. If I said penis and I said vagina, the a, a six pack bar of soap is getting thrown to my head. And my grandma is attacking me. <laughs> and this isn't even on just the no abusive things. It's just my grandma was a southerner. And this is, you're going to get the first thing I see and you tackle you. But that was cursing, is saying what words that you hear around the neighborhood. And most doctors and most people don't understand that this is how they speak. And then they get confused. So it's, yeah, addressing and understanding how this is how somebody talks, ebonically, however they are around their friends. But then also saying, okay, well, this is what you say, but it's also called this, and this is their function. Well, what do you think that this is? So that way, it's not just assuming that this person doesn't know, but actually asking them, what do you think the function is? Or what do you know what it does to add on so people won't feel like, oh, okay, I don't know anything at all. Because it's already intimidating, one, to say that you have a problem, any kind of problem. And then to go to the doctor and to say, something as secretive or, and I, and I say secretive or majestic because vaginas and penises, people don't really talk about. It's not glorified. It's not really sex positive when it comes to these conversations. And it's, it's, it's something that should be because it should be magical. At least that's how I see it. it, it, it so much happens with it. <laughs> but um, I think for me, it's more so actually having these conversations and being open to what your patient has to say and understanding that they might not be totally lost and then they might be, but meeting them where they are and not trying to force it because it's already a comfortable situation, uh, uncomfortable situation for that other person. So just meeting them where they are, I think is the biggest thing and not assuming that because they're, and, and I'm maybe speaking on my part, but and not even just my, my part, it's also understanding like somebody might be married, somebody might be in a relationship, but what does that relationship look for them? Because not everybody views the same relationship as what a typical relationship might be. Whether it's, I see relationships in growing up where my grandmother didn't have anybody. And yes, I lived primarily with my grandmother, but she was by herself. So her relationship was to teach me was to not depend on nobody. And I didn't get, it wasn't the 50-50 of, this is how you are with your partner. I didn't get that. I had to learn that for myself and what I needed. So when it comes to other people healthy relationships, it's I see somebody else might be getting smacked every day. And for them, that's a way of getting shown love and that's their healthy relationship. So I really think it's identifying what other people feel and see what healthy relationships are. What they view as what is a relationship? Because not everybody has that same view. And then actually having that conversation on how is that helping you for your lifestyle, period, and what do you need? Because there's a lot of times where I've had past doctors where they didn't ask me why I'm not, ha why wouldn't I have sex? Like, it's not, I don't wanna have sex with my husband. I'm tired. I've been at work. I've been in school. I have a, a six year old at that time. Um, medication, there is fatigue with the medication. Sometimes I'm just not in it. Or you asking me about me and my husband, but you're not asking if we invite somebody else in the relationship. Like you're not asking if this is if we're having for unicorn status and we're in in different people are coming in. It's not these are not questions that is asked. It's like, okay, you're monogamous, but what does monogamy look like for you? 
and we throw out these words, but we don't encourage people to actually explore what this looks like. It's just, you know, this is what you should be doing. This is what you need to be doing and moving forward versus, again, meeting them where they are and having these conversations. So I think it's that level of conversation and understanding on both sides, not just because you are a provider and you are supposed to know everything. It's also understanding that the person might know stuff too and give them a chance in asking questions. So, Thanks. right. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, Oni, you want to add, you have anything to add to that? You're on mute. <laughs> um, Tim hit on a lot of the major points and just thinking as a healthcare provider, so often being on the other end of it, the reality is we're often, you know, we're not taught in medical school, I'm a physician taught in medical school, um, you know, we're only talking about how to think about sex and sexuality as an important part of overall health and well-being. You know, a lot of times when we think about sex and sexuality, it's in the context of, you know, screening someone for sexually transmitted infection, right? And so there's an emphasis more on um, disease and versus pleasure. Um, and so how do we have those conversations with our patients and be not judgmental and, and be sex positive? And I know that's why we often work as a big part of a, part of a team and we have, you know, other, other team members who may be, um, you know, have more expertise and are trained in having these conversations, but also like, you know, you're a nurse practitioner, PA, physician should know how to have, have these kinds of conversations with you. And the reality is, um, is that we don't. And it was just funny, I was, um, Kim was talking about her conversations with her, her son. So I have a seven-year-old and my seven-year-old, I guess when he was like five or six, was seeing all of these signs all over the subway for the Museum of Sex here in New York. And he was like, mommy, what is the sex? It is everywhere. <laughs> so we've been talking about it over the last few years. Um, and so I also know, this is maybe TMI, um, you know, he, he, you know, he enjoys, you know, it, it, as is very normal developmentally, you know, touching himself with his, his penis and, and he enjoys it. And I said to him, you know, sweetie, it's, you know, mommy, mommy's really excited that this feels good for you. I want you to know that you can do this in the privacy of your room or in your, ba in your bathroom. When we're out at the table, it's not appropriate to do at the table or, you know, out of, you know, in the open, just so you know, but we make sure. And he said, okay. So the other day he was doing, and he goes, mommy, is, am I having sex with myself? And I was like, kinda, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, 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 kinda, you guys, that's what you said. We call it masturbation. So I'm trying to like give him the language. Again, we use like, um, mm -hmm. anatomy, you know, penis, scrotum. We just, we just use all of that because, because it's actually using that language apparently is also um, associated with having children being less likely to be preyed upon by people who want to abuse them. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, just to say that we all in our families as healthcare providers, you know, as allied health professionals or whatever role need to be having these conversations um, with our young people in particular, but also I saw people saying that there are women in their 40s who don't even know what their vaginas look like and maybe older. Mm -hmm. So right. getting really comfortable you know, with ourselves. So, you know, self breast exams aren't necessarily, um, they actually don't detect more cancer, but they don't lead to health, health benefits in the way of decreased breast cancer, but they're good in terms of getting familiar with your anatomy and how things feel and getting comfortable with, with, with touching yourself and touching your breasts or, what, or your boobs or whatever you call them. So yes, so that's just adding on to what, what all the wonderful stuff that Kimberly was saying. Real quick, I'm sorry. My, something my grandmother said was, do not let somebody else tell you what your smell is. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I tell that to my kids because it's like, you can smell yourself and it feels like for like underarm sweatiness, but it goes through your body period. And I kind of just like went on with it because it's like, you can tell when you smell. Like you can smell it first. And unless you are congested and you just <laughs> know. But putting your fingers and touching yourself and smelling what your normal smell is and then figuring out this is, this is what I'm not supposed to smell like. This is what I should smell like. But understanding that before somebody else tells you what that is. And I think that's a missed part is being okay to touch yourself. That even as adults, there's a stigma against with just touching your body and understanding what this feels like. Feeling what the inside of your vagina feels like. Touching your penis, touching your scrotum. A lot of people just use it and then don't or don't clean it properly because there's no education i keep saying it's education there's no education and conversations about what this what it what it what's the function and what needs to happen right um that is credible conversation and what your grandma said your grandma and my mom must have been friends because <laughs> my mom, everything your grandma said that was my mom's model um so listen this was, is just such great conversation and you are giving people such 
not only the great conversation, but really things to walk away with. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, and I wanted to get some questions from our, our participants. And so, guys, we're going to go to the Q&A box, and um, we're going to choose some questions to, to actually present to Oni and Kimberly uh, before we end today. Okay. So there are several questions in here. Uh, feel free to add more. Uh, let me start with this one because this one is a little bit different than what we've talked about so far. Someone asks here, how do you feel that black men can help support this conversation in our community? I'll pose that to both of you, whoever would like to answer. Kimberly, do you want to go? You can go. <laughs> Gosh, um, that is like the question, right? Because I, I honestly think like for black women, we often are the ones like giving the most support to one another. Um, so I, a lot of it's really, I think about, I think a lot, my responsibility in part is like with my son, like I want to make sure that he understands like the ways in which like life is different for me as a, as a black woman. Like remember we did a March for black women um, a year or two ago. And he said to me, mommy, like, when is the March for little black boys? And I was like, okay. Whoa. I was like, I, I was like, I, there, it will be another day today. <laughs> we're focusing on black women. And like, and these are the reasons why, because black women have to deal with like being black and also being women. And it makes it a lot harder for us. And we have, you know, a lot of different responsibilities and whatever. So he's heard this a lot, but I don't know. Part of me, for me, is my responsibility is like raising a black boy who will become a black, well, if he decides to become a black, if he does self-identifies as a man, become a black man um, who is going to be like a feminist and will advocate for women and be a supporter and a friend to black women. That... I don't know, other than that, other than that um, I'll, I'll pass it over to Kimberly. Um, <laughs> I say one of the, the things that a black man can do is, if you know something, don't hold it. Actually have that conversation. And I, and I use that as my husband. He, we've been together since we were, Jesus Lord, 17, 16, 17, we've been together. Um, and when he's with his people at, at sanitation and they're just chilling, and they're just talking and it's like the end of the day and somebody will talk about oh shorty's burning he's the one that comes up and it's like burning so what does that mean because he's been with me since the beginning so it's like for him he's just as educated if not more educated because he helped me on time where he's like no this is what it is as i'm getting my training he's helping me understand and breaking it down or i'm doing a lecture and i'm helping he's helping me by getting more understanding. So with him, he's bringing that information and he's bringing it to his friends and actually having not the, the fake conversations of, yeah, man, she's burning, but actually, what do you need? Did you get tested? What do you, what is your role? What role are you playing a part of it? So I think if more men actually have that open world conversation and it might be awkward, but actually saying what they know that's actually accurate might actually change how a lot of men view and want to support women. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Really important question. Someone said, William said, this is truly a time where black men such as myself need to step up our game even more to help our black queens with anything and everything that they are dealing with. And he says, can I get some brother to say amen and agree with me? Yeah. So all the brothers on the line, please say <laughs> amen. And, and, and just to say, someone else wrote that, like, Black men have to support Black women, even if they're not attracted to them, <laughs> and yes. are, you know, sexually or romantically. And I, and I appreciate that point, because you have to look at everyone, and you can't just be like, oh, um, you know, I have a sister, I have a mother. This is another human being. So, mm -hmm. like, whether you like them or not, whether they're related to you or not, you should advocate for Black women. That's, like, part of what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and then, so, I'm sorry, someone also wrote that I hesitated when I said if my, my son grows up and... So, you know, right now his gender identity and one that I've imposed on him is as a, a boy, as a cisgender boy, but he may grow up and want to be a woman. Like, I don't know. So that's why I said that. I said, you know, if he, he's older and he continues to identify as a black man, I want him to advocate for black women. Whoever he becomes, I want him to advocate for black women. Yes. Yeah, uh, Obi, you, hit, you hit the point I was going to say, don't look out for black women you're related to only yeah. or attracted to yes. only. That was, that was a, yeah, a major a one. Because if somebody else is somebody else's daughter, somebody else's. Right. Okay. Yes. 
Um, okay, so there's so many questions. Let me try to get to one more. So someone, at least one more. So someone here, uh, Yvette Hewitt, maybe, uh, oh, we could actually open the lines. I didn't think about that. Yeah, um, yeah it's 123. Uh, we have done exactly at 130, so we may only have time for one more, unfortunately. I'm sorry, the conversation was so rich. I love the panel discussion. So probably just one more, Hannah. Okay, uh, Yvette Hewitt. We'll try to unmute your line so you can ask your question. It was about uh, rates of hysterectomies. You can read it in the Q&A in case you didn't remember exactly what it was. Yeah, we love the ability to be able to open up the line and we did want to do that a little early, but we just couldn't stop our great conversation. Um, so I'm the line to be more interactive to you know hear the voice of all oh, really cool. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead again. Hi, I just thank you for presenting this forum. It's just been absolutely wonderful. But I just wanted to see if someone there on the panel could address hysterectomies since there's such a high rate being performed on our this particular age group and the correlation with that to uterine fibroids and I myself had to have a hysterectomy because of that. And when you go to the doctors, they're just still clueless about the whole um, epidemic of black women and hysterectomies and fibroids. It's just a, a dangerous spiral. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, just to say, I, I'm not an obstetrician gynecologist. I'm a primary care provider of uh, women's health. So other folks have much more expertise than I do on this topic. But just to say that um, I think any discussion around like such a significant surgery, like a hysterectomy, like it should involve shared decision making. So with your provider, um, you know, understanding like what your values and preferences are, you know, what's what's important to you, what things that you're, you can do away with, um, and really having that conversation and not having the provider be the one that determines like what you, what ends up happening. So I think that's just, just with anything, whether it's medication, it's procedures. Um, there is there is data that's, that suggests that black women are, have a higher um, prevalence or more likely to have fibroids. Um, I'm not as familiar with, with that literature, although there seems to also be some something around also, I'm not sure if people have seen this, there's a whole article in a really well-regarded journal around um, relaxers as well, like just the chemicals that we're exposed to um, could potentially increase our risk. And if there's anyone on the call who knows more than me, please, please raise your hand and, and put in a, a comment. Um, but I would think that there are probably a number of environmental stressors that we're exposed to that likely contribute to our increased risk. There are many different ways to um, address fibroids depending on the size of them. And so that's why I say when you talk with your provider, it could be that surgery might be the only, given the size of it or whatever it is, the only way to address it. But just making sure that you understand like what are all the options that are available. There's uterine artery embolizations, there are myomectomies where they just remove the, the one fibroid and leave everything else. So just making sure that you have um, just you're knowledgeable on all that's available because many times like providers, I mean, we see this, this is a little different, but like, this is very different, but get like dental, like dentists, like black people getting their teeth pulled out as opposed to like being offered other options besides like having your full tooth removed. Like this happens a lot or like with amputations as well. So just making sure that you're as informed as possible about what all your options are. Thank you, Oni. I feel like we are running uh, really low on time, but I wanted to make sure that each of you could at least just give one path forward, one thing, if you had to choose one thing, and I know there's so many, uh, mm -hmm. what would you recommend to providers or to others that are working with Black women within this population on how we can improve health outcomes? What would be your recommendation? We can start with Kim and then tell me. Hmm. I think be open-minded. Um, be open to the process that things are going to change. Um, me working in this, me working in this field, is so many terminologies have been changed, so many guidelines have been changed, and being open to one, what the change is, is happening, but then also understanding that it's changing for me as somebody who provides a service, but then also it's changing for the client who's actually living with it, and as somebody who is living with HIV and had to, from birth and then now, 33 years later, almost 34, 
it that whole thing has changed so much from medication guidelines to the name to how how often I even go to the doctor now. So it went from like every other week to now it's every six months because I'm on medication. So it's like just understanding that for me, it might not be easy as a patient, but then also it might not be easy as a provider as well and being open to that process and consulting and talking with other other colleagues about this and an understanding that they might be struggling too, but they don't want to say anything. And I think that's where we miss it, where we, we don't have these conversations enough with each other and, and honestly listening to what the patients have to say. So. Thank you, Kim. Thank Please. you. Yeah, and just to yeah, piggyback on what um, Kim was saying, and I think someone in the comments said, like, just listening to Black women, because, like, we are the experts of our own experience. Um, and so, like, active listening is incredibly important, that skill of, like, listening to understand and to comprehend and not, like, respond, but just really listening to understand the other person's experience. Um, I think is really important, and obviously being patient-centered, but again, just recognizing that Black women you know, we know what our lives are about and, and really to listen to us as experts in that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Again, day two of incredible, incredible conversation. Just the comments that have come in are just, are just wonderful. This was such a great panel. I just want to thank Oni and Kimberly so much. This was excellent. And you guys, you, you guys did not disappoint. <laughs> So thank you very much to our panelists, um, Oni and Kimberly, and of course to our, to our moderator, co-moderator Hannah Testimon, who's always uh, uh, on her game, always. So um, we just have a few last slides. Um, again, this is um, how to request your credits. <clears throat> Please do so. And um, we just have a few slides to go on about our synchronicity conference. Please register. Um, Sync 2020 is our first virtual conference. And why I bring this up, there's going to be so many great continue conversations about black women. So please go and check out um, our conference, SING 2020. These are all the sessions and plenaries and institutes we will have, well, over 200 speakers. Um, it's gonna be pretty incredible. Uh, so we hope you guys could join us. Uh, we will also be offering CE, CME, all the credits um, that will be provided to the same uh, postgraduate institute for medicine and health HIV, same credits that are gonna be provided for today. Um, these are our five plenary sessions, um, and we have great things on aging and women, so this would be really great. Uh, we also have 13 tracks, substance use, women's health, social determinants of health, um, uh, clinical health. So this is also going to be a great session. And our seven institutes, um, the generational health and the women's health track. Those are my tracks. They're going to be great. So I thought oh, this. Oni's baby. Um, so they're going to be great. Please check us out for those seven institutes. And also um, the special set, set session on intersexual stigma and access, uh, uh, access to care. This is going to be really great because we're going to talk about a lot of racial and ethnic and gender issues. So this is going to be a good one. And also we're going to have a Black Women's Health Institute and a Black Women's Health track. So the institute will be September 9th, 2 to 4 p.m. Please, this is gonna be, this is gonna be really great. And this is the conversation is gonna continue into sync. So please, I want you guys to join us there. And the women's health track sessions, end of the epidemic by improving women's health literacy. Health literacy is, is so important for um, health outcomes. Engaging women in HIV care and address disparities among women to end HIV epidemic. Again, thank everyone today for joining us and tomorrow, it's going to be another good one. Session three, promoting health and wellness for Black older women. So again, thank you, Hannah, Oni, Kimberly, um, Health HIV for allowing us to put this on. Everybody have a great, great day and stay Hello. safe. More information about technical assistance on our last slide. Have a good day. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.